So it was 20 years ago Sergeant Peppers taught the band to play. Great CD, I like it. Uh, it was 22 years ago that Linux um, burst onto the, the world platform. Linus Torvalds released the first version of Linux. OSCON's been around for 15 years. The Free Software Foundation was started in uh, 1984, so that's uh, getting on for 30 years. Um, just for fun, before when I was preparing this talk, I, I, I went and I looked for the first commit that I did to a, to a significant project, which was the GIMP, back in December 2012. Um, I also found the second commit that I did, which was, uh, oh crap, 10 minutes after sending the first email, <sighs> there was an off by one error, which leads me to the fact that there are two difficult problems in computer science, cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. So um, we're getting old. I turn 40 next year. Jesus, I'm, I'm losing my memory. I, every time I go to the airport now, I have to take a picture of where I park my car so that I can find it when I come back. I swear to God, I have a bunch of these photos. Uh, every single time, there's multi-story car parks in the, in, in the train station. I am not kidding you. This is, so somebody ran into the back of us. We've got a, when, I go to the, when I go abroad, I take the, the beat-up jalopy to the airport. Um, I also do the same thing with hotel rooms. I don't know if anybody else got this tip. It was, it, was, it was Ross Turk from Ink Tank who put me onto this tip. We're losing our memory. We're getting old. But the great thing about getting old is that uh, more and more people who I knew the first time I came to a free software conference were students or just recently graduated. Well, now we're, we're all getting married and we're having kids. And uh, the great thing about having kids is that they're blank slates. You get to program them. You get to decide what their moral code is. You get to, to, to pass on your values to the next generation. You can indoctrinate them. And uh, so these are my three kids. Uh, Thomas, 11 years old, Paul, eight, Sean, six years old. Sean is a cheeky one there. You can maybe see that <laughs> on the picture. And I have been trying to, uh, to instill some of the, the values that I think are important about the free software and the hacker culture uh, with my kids, and we're going to share some of the examples here. But it's not been easy. All right, computing has evolved since I learned how to program, since I, learned how to, since I started getting interested in, in computers. Um, my first computer was something like this. This is not a picture of my first computer, but it's something. Uh, it's, uh, it, so I had a uh, 486DX2. 66 megahertz when you, had, when you had the turbo button on. And um, first time I installed Linux, I had to take the side off, side off the computer, which I could, you know, um, because to figure out, to install Linux and get the net network working, I need to go in and figure out what, uh, what the chipset was on the NIC and things like that, right? I had to figure out what the scan lines were for my monitor after blowing up the first one. Um, those were the good old days, right? Uh, back then, this is how you installed software. You downloaded a tar GZ, uh, you uncompressed it, you went into the, th into, into the, the, the directory and configure, make, make, install. Right? So you had to figure out, to use the software, you had to figure out all of the tool chain that you needed, all of the dependencies that you needed to install. You had everything on your computer to actually um, compile and make new software. So it was an easy step, because actually the hardest part uh, I mean, over and over I've heard this, the hardest part of getting people programming and contributing to a project, getting people to make that first change, that one-line patch that they then have to go and correct with an off-by-one error. Uh, but the hardest part of that is actually getting the tool chain installed, actually getting software compiled. That's the hardest part of getting somebody to contribute to a software project. And back in the day, that was, that was how it was done. You, you had no choice. Right, because, uh, okay, the first system I installed was, was, was a, a Red Hat Linux, as it happens, uh, coincidentally. Um, uh, I now work at Red Hat, but, but uh, the first system I installed was Red Hat Linux, but most of the software that you wanted to use, like the GIMP, for example, only existed as source code. That was what projects shipped. There wasn't the massive repository of software that you could install at, at, at will, as we, as we now have. 
and, uh, and, and the world's evolved, right? I, the, personal desktop computing is no longer the major focus of the technology world, right? The world is mobile, it's phones and tablets, it's the web. And the problem is, in a world where we have web and mobile, and everything is free software, so it's great, right? All the, the cloud software, uh, all of the uh, web stack that people are using to code web applications, all of the web applications are all open source. Um, well, many of the web applications are open source. But if I have a bug in my email client, if my email client is Gmail, I'm kind of stuck. If my video player is YouTube, I don't like the, the way it behaves. I can't change it. So, so where's the user freedom? How do we... Uh, I'm only going to moralize for a little while here. Uh, and it's been, a diff it's been difficult for me because, because some of the, the things that I would have done uh, getting started, you know, getting a, a, the computer, like my first computer was a, uh, showing my age a little bit, but I've already told you how old I am, so it doesn't matter. It was a ZX Spectrum, a Sinclair Spectrum 128K plus 2, and it came with a book that had, like, how to write basic, right? It, it had the kind of the basic reference guide, and you got some source code at the back, and it was great. But we're breeding a generation of young people who the world is read-only. Their computing world is read-only. It's video games, it's mobile devices, it's websites. We're teaching them learned help helplessness. It's like those psych experiments. Anybody heard of the, the five monkeys experiment, experiment, which is probably apocryphal, but it's the story of five monkeys that are put in a cage, and there's a, a, they can get food by pulling on a lever. So they learn very quickly that they pull on the lever, they get food. And, uh, and after a while, there's a shower head installed over the cage. And so when a monkey goes to pull on the lever, he still gets food, but every, all of the monkeys in the cage get showered with an ice-cold shower. And um, very quickly, the monkeys m realize that there's a link between the pulling of the lever and the ice-cold shower, and so they start assaulting any monkey that tries to pull the lever, right? They jump on him and, and, and beat him down. And over time, you can change. You remove monkeys from the, from the cage and you put in a new monkey and he will go and he'll try and get the food, he'll try and pull the lever and he will be beaten down. And after you've changed all the original monkeys, you've got just monkeys who realize that food trying to get the lever results in a beatdown. They've learned that they have no control over this experience and so you can turn off the, the, the ice cold shower. It doesn't matter anymore because none of the monkeys will ever get to the lever. They're helpless. And we're kind of teaching our kids that way. Is that they, if something is wrong with your computing environment, it's, oh, well, there's nothing I can do. And so that's been kind of a problem that, for me. Because one of the values that I value about the free software ethos is the world is read-write. Uh, so this is a Steve Jobs' quote. It's, uh, life, life can be much broader once you discover the simple fact that everything around you that you call life was made up by people who are no smarter than you, and you can understand it, you can poke it, you, know, you can mold it, you can play with the world. And once you realize that, you realize you're no longer beholden to the choices that other people make for you. And so that value is really something that I wanted to pass on to my kids. It is potentially worth pointing out the, the incredible irony of Apple products being invented by the man who, who said this. But I think it's a, a, very, a very worthwhile sentiment. And I could have picked half a dozen other people who, who have said something similar about the free software world. So sharing is good. It's another key value that I want to share with my kids, is that, is that participating in a, in a group experiment of making something is, is good. And that freedom is not having to ask permission, giving a certain amount of freedom. Freedom to do things that maybe I don't want them to do. Uh, but that I know that you know, they're not going to kill themselves doing it, so they may hurt themselves, you know, maim a little bit. But um, giving them the freedom to make mistakes and teaching them with, with that freedom comes the responsibility that comes with it. So these are the values that I want to try and pass on to the kids. Uh, so I'm going to go over a few things that we've done, basically six categories of things that we've, we've done from, I mean, very young age, right up to 11 years old, uh, to kind of indoctrinate our kids to the hacker way. And, and none of it, that buying t-shirts with free software logos. I, I love projects that make kids size t-shirts. I think it's great. I love this t-shirt from the GNOME project, uh, which is a project I've been uh, a part of for a long time. 
Um, so these are six projects, six tips uh, that I that things that we've done that we we try and try and pass on those values that are important to us. So the first one is creative toys. Toys that allow first building and uh, and allow some creativity in play. And the thing about toys is they have to be fun. Uh, I was at a, a boff yesterday evening um, by a lady called Erin Peterson, who's got a, a hacker space up in Seattle, or near Seattle, um, where she, you know, she's teaching kids about technology. And, and uh, one of the things she says is it's got to be more chocolate than broccoli. Right? Um, sometimes you feel like that teaching IT to kids is, is it, you have to learn this because it's important. Uh, and that's you know, the easiest way to get a kid to completely zone out and, and have no interest in it. So, Kaplas. This is, I don't know if you guys know about this toy. They're little wooden planks that have very simple proportions. Now, this is a kind of a complicated set that has some extra shapes and stuff. But the basic Kaplas, they have uh, very simple proportions. They're three times as large as they are, as wide as they are thick, and they're five times as long as they are wide. And with those simple proportions, what you find is that like really preschool kids and kindergarten kids will, will, will do things like this. They'll make walls and forts, and, and, and it's great. But as you get a little bit older, uh, you've got a little manual book that comes where you start exploring with shapes, and you see, you know, kind of not very attractive, but uh, th this is a, this is a, a kind of a, a cone shape that, that Paul made. He was very proud of. And very quickly, you get to sort of basic physics principles of, uh, well, if you put too much load or charge on uh, too far away from a pivot point, then the whole thing is going to fall down. And you end up very quickly with like a seven-year-old building a bridge, and it's, uh, he, he was very proud of this. And of course, I love playing with them as well. So some of these photos are actually going to be stuff that, that I did. Um, and very quickly, they get pretty intricate. And uh, uh, you have, it's very easy. This is one type of wooden brick. There's not, no construction involved. Uh, so this is a great toy, I think, that the, that the kids have loved uh, for both the learning experience and the, the ability to make cool stuff. IKEA train sets is another one. I mean, preschool level, they just change them, chain them together, and they go from one end of the room to the other, and then they turn the train around, and they go all the way back. That's fine, too. Uh, but very quickly, kind of how to make a loop and how to make a, a kind of a closed loop over, over a complicated shape. Uh, they, they, and they make loads of bridges and underpasses and overpasses. Great. Meccano is another toy we love. Uh, it's got evo an evaluative model, so they've got different product lines um, for sort of five to eight-year-olds and for eight to eight and up. This is, so the equivalent, the US equivalent of Meccano is Erector Sets, I think. Is that, is that correct? Can somebody nod at me or shake their head? So, so these, are, these are the chunky small, uh, small age ones from five to eight. And they've got kind of big holes, big rubber, big plastic pieces, flexible bits that flex, flex around. They make kind of pretty cool, cool toys. And they're really easy for kids to use. Like the tools, the tools involved are, are, are really simple. And then you move on to the, uh, to, to the kind of the, the, the older model with the smaller nuts and bolts. One of the things I love about this is uh, my fingers are too big to use these, right? The, making these is really hard for me, so the kids are actually better at it than me. And once the kids get better than me at something, I think that's a key step in their learning process. Of course, building blocks, whether it's the, the big chunky Duplo type blocks or Lego has been a standard fixture in our house. And the great thing you get with, uh, with all of these toys, uh, whether it's uh, Lego, is eventually you get the creativity of, I mean, I, I would never have thought of using the wheels as eyes for, a, for it. Oh, I thought that was great. Um, you get the cre creativity of mixing and matching, right? So you'll get Kepler bridges going over, go over, going over the IKEA trains with Playmobil toys standing on top of it, and uh, and that mixing and matching is 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 the, the remix aspect of of these toys is, is great. The second thing is hackable living space. So this is Paul's room. It drives us nuts. Absolutely nuts. He has a substantial amount of, of, uh, of control over it. Paul is an artist. Right? You're going to see a picture of that later. So he kind of puts his art all up, up all over the place. Or sh not, not Paul, Sean. Sugar. I hope my wife's not watching the, the video of this, if, if there is one. Um, Sean is an artist. And he puts his art all up, up all over the doors. And one of the things that we did in his room is we put a, a, this clothesline along so he can hang things up. And he hangs his what he calls his work 
And so when he's working a lot, I know I'm working a lot because he's kind of emulating his dad, and it's a sign to me that I need to spend a little bit more time with him. Uh, but kind of giving him control over his own bedroom, and, and all, all of the kids have this uh, certain amount of control over their own bedroom, which, as I said, drives us nuts, but it also creates this link between you have freedom, there is a responsibility involved as well. But also home, home improvements, home crafts, right? So this is, a, this is a, a kind of a shoe stand that we made because we had too many shoes. And you can see there's still shoes on the floor here, so it's not, <laughs> it's overflowed already. Uh, but the kids painted this, and, uh, and they loved it, right? It was something that they, they were, Daddy, can we paint? Daddy, can we paint? And I was kind of, well, I don't know if it's a good idea. And then I said, okay, let's just paint. And um, they made a mess, but they were very proud of the, uh, the end result. And this is a kind of an arts and crafts project that we, that, that we did together. Right? We had a piece of plywood. They love basketball, all of them. Uh, we got this uh, basketball ring from the dump, uh, which was all rusty, and we sanded it down. They spray painted it. They painted the, the chipboard that we cut into this shape. And we made the, the basketball ring to put up the front of the house. And the fact that they were involved in the making of it means that they value it that much more afterwards. And then there's also the hacking, the improvisation. To, you take what's, whatever's lying around. So this is a swing that Thomas made. Uh, from, from a rope that he took from the garage, tied it to, a, to a, a, a little piece of wood that was in the garden, slung it over a branch, and he was swinging away on it. It actually broke about 10 minutes after that. He hurt himself. Power responsibility. It's perfect. So that, that this idea of you take whatever you got is another key aspect of you, the improvisation is, is, is another key aspect that we love about the, the hacker culture. Um, if you've got a garden, set the kids free on it. They're going to need some, garden, some guidance. So we moved into a house last year, and uh, it was one of my, my greatest pleasures in the house was, was growing a garden. We had some lettuce, carrots, tomatoes. Uh, we got some, some great um, squash, pumpkins. We had zucchini, uh, courgette for, for anybody here who's in France. And we had a, a few crops that failed as well. And... Um, the kids were, you, you could not believe how proud they were of seeing their work and, you know, watering, planting, and, uh, and seeing the work come to fruition. And, uh, you know, it's hard to get kids to eat vegetables at the best of times, but they loved eating the stuff from our garden. Uh, this is actually cheating. Some of this stuff came from the market. <laughs> but it's, it's not cheating because I'm telling you, right? And um, we also had, so, as I said, we had some crop failures. We had uh, some red peppers, and we had... Uh, aubergines, uh, eggplants, which um, basically were, were a total flop. Uh, we had another crop, which was uh, uh, some of the lettuce was eaten by, by bugs, and it was, you know, we needed to protect the plants, and we didn't, and it was like, eh, okay. So now we've learned a lesson. We learned that, you know, tending to the garden gives us better results. Uh, fourth thing, arts and crafts. So we make lots of stuff in the house. We, I mean, it's, I, all kids do this. I, I don't think this is anything in particular special. Um, as I said, Sean is committed to his art. Um, so we have things like um, the, you know, the centerpiece at the, at the table is made out of cardboard. So you always have lots of cardboard, scissors lying around. Uh, leaving tools lying around is another key thing we do. Lots of spare fabric that people can make little bits and pieces out of. Uh, in Leon, we have a tradition on the 8th of December that you put candles out in the window. And um, so decorating the pots is another thing we do. But this is all just decoration, I guess. Um, we also have integrated some of that into, into things that we've done in the house. So this is a, we, we painted a, a globe on an Ikea bulb lamp. Um, this is something we did with the kids. I did the drawing, the outline they painted. And uh, it's not perhaps geographically accurate, but it was close enough that it was a, it was a good map of the world for the, for the, and they loved it. Homemade costumes are great. Uh, this is Sean here in the, uh, I mean, this was a, a cut-down T-shirt and up, uh, cut-down T-shirt, some cardboard and, and some pieces of, of fur from uh, that we got in, a, in an arts and crafts store. Um, I mean, the costumes don't have to be great, but the fact that the kids are, are participating in the creation of the costume means that they value them that much more. Again, the improvisation of picking, you know, keeping things like toilet rolls and kitchen rolls, um, making making little animals out of toothpicks and corks of bottles is something we love doing. Uh, Scooby-Doo, uh, which is called Gimp, I think. Hmm? Boondoggle? Gimp, we love these. This, this, the kids started this, and they got me onto it. So this is, uh, this is an example of, of uh, 
when you show that that you know you get you can get excited about making stuff as well, and um, they were really impressed that I got some of that. So this uh, this uh, spirally one there is uh, is my favorite. It was a bit of a challenge to get it started, but and so when um, yeah, and they see you getting excited about it, they get they get that much more excited about it as well. And we got loads of stuff like this. Uh, th this is uh, so little bags of lollipop sticks, uh, popsicle sticks, and glue guns, right? So we have a few glue guns that we just leave lying around, and um, and the kids love it. So we've got things like this, but we also have learning experiences. So we did a bridge building exercise, um, and again, improvisation. We didn't have anything to measure how much strain the bridge would go under, so we we kind of jerry rigged up something with a coat hanger and and <laughs> my toolbox. Uh, there were marks on the floor after that. Um, but then, you know, we realized that this wasn't particularly good. We went onto the internet, we did some research, and we came up with, uh, and, and, and Thomas uh, made this one, which is actually remarkably strong. I could stand on this and it wouldn't break. Uh, he did all the glue work on this as well. So it was, it was, it's, it's kind of valuable learning experiences as well as, as well as arts and crafts. The fact that we have the tools lying around makes it easier. That was a, a science experiment, how to get a, an egg floating in the middle of water. That's, Anyone know how to do it? Salt, yeah, but then it'll float on the top. <laughs> hmm? Less salt, then it'll float on the bottom. No, so, so you make salt water until the, the egg floats, and then you, you put uh, still water, uh, pour it over a spoon, and they don't mix. Handy tip. Okay, so we're getting to the technical stuff, which is probably what you're most interested in. Um, teaching electronics. So one of the things that we found when working on electronics with the kids, and I started maybe a couple of years ago with Thomas, and, uh, and Paul's gotten involved pretty early, is um, electricity is kind of tricky. Right? So you start by teaching them how circuits work. Uh, so things like conductive putty uh, have been very useful. Uh, so you make it one batch of non-conductive putty and then one batch of conductive putty with salt in it. And, and then you have, you know, you know your, your, your basically your circuits are, are, are a little bit easier. I just teaching people that you can hook up, teaching the kids that you can hook up a, a battery to a switch, to a buzzer, and when you turn on the switch that the, ba the, the buzzer works, and if you, if you do it the wrong way, then, then something blows up. It's kind of cool. Uh, one of the things that we've done for the electronics that's been really, really good is um, taking apart toys. So you can see the electric uh, motor here. That came from a broken remote control car. Um, and we do this all the time. You know, once, once the kids have the power to, uh, to take a screwdriver and take a toy apart when it's not working anymore, or even when it is, um, it, gives them, it removes that mystery and that fear. It, turn, it turns the toy from something which was packaged, a black box read-only, to something which is read-write that they can play with after it's died, after its end of life. Uh, so we do a lot of Arduino stuff. Um, the Arduino is great. I found that what works best for us in doing Arduino stuff is, is kind of pair, pair programming. So I will help them set up the circuits. Uh, the programming, we'll get to that a little bit later, is a little bit complicated for them at this point. Um, but then once the program and the circuit are working, they'll swap bits, bits in and out. They'll change numbers in the program. And, 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 and they love seeing the real life effect of something that they, they've worked on. Also soldering, um, soldering. Am I pronouncing that correctly? For, uh, for <laughs> Was I pronouncing it correctly first? We say solder in Ireland. Um, so having a soldering iron around so that when you can, so that we have uh, the little Ubuntu clips that we solder onto the right places on, on, on the toy bits so that we can reuse them. Uh, so this is a, a photovoltaic cell that we got off a, off a garden, like a garden light thing. Um, and then you can use them in the Arduino and the, you can plug them in. You don't need to be, have, uh, you don't need to have uh, any extra bits. So uh, this kind of creativity where you take the toys apart and you figure out how you make them into a normal, like, simple circuit, and then saying, okay, now we can try and program it, right? Let's see how we can figure out to make the engine turn on when this other thing happens, when we, like, when we turn off the light or when we turn on the light or whatever. And it's been interesting because I'm not an electronics guy by no means, but, so we've been learning together. Uh, so actually, uh, I was at the Arduino workshop on Wednesday, Tuesday, the Arduino tutorial on Tuesday. And um, I found out how to use a, a transistor to, because one of the things about the Arduino is that you've got an amp limit on the pins. It's, so there's a, there's a current limit on the pin. So I was trying to control the motor with, a, with pin, it's pin 11, it doesn't matter. 
um, a pin which was going to high and the other side was connected to ground and that wasn't working and I didn't understand why. I said, well, because you're not getting enough voltage. So what you've got to do is connect a, a transistor. So you connect one side to five volts and the other side to ground. I'm just telling you this because I just found, about, found out about this. I'm really excited about it. Uh, and then you, once the once the other pin goes to high, the five the five volt five volts goes to ground with the the full. You get the so you turn it on. It's kind of ooh, cool. So now I know something new. <laughs> um, so you all know at this point that I am not an electronics guy. Um, also soldering bl blisters, right? So kids and me, it's been great. <laughs> uh, actually, the kids are pretty good at the soldering at this point. Okay. Uh, one other thing that we do is try and uh, encourage coding literacy. I have found that programming is, that for my kids, my kids are normal kids, we have uh, a limited amount of time. I'm jealous of all the, 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 uh, the parents that I see uh, tweeting about their genius kids who, who, are, who have already written a C compiler at 10 years old or something. I don't know. The attention span of, of Thomas is about 15 minutes. So if, if I can get something working in 15 minutes and get him interested in it, then he'll play with it for a while, and he'll actually try and make it better. Um, but if, if he's just, uh, he either if I tell him, OK, write in that code sample and see what it does, that's not going to work. Uh, so the coding has been a challenge. The goal is to get something that is useful and that he can see a direct effect very quickly. And if you're not getting that, then he's not getting into it. So one of the things that we uh, that I found is useful for the coding is, is the Arduino. Um, I mentioned that. So uh, we've got all the code snippet libraries. So we'll help, you know, set up the set up the um, uh, the circuit together, and then we'll use the, the the we'll start from the library and then make changes and see what happens. And he loves that, right? He, sometimes he'll make changes and nothing happens, and he'll say, "Okay, I broke something." He's now at the point where he understands the syntax errors that are coming up at the bottom, and he can try and figure out how to fix it. Um, he still is not at the point where control structures and, and, and if, else, and um, is very uh, if, else. Uh, it's not quite, he's, he doesn't quite get it yet, but, but he's getting there. Uh, Scratch, obviously, uh, this came up in the earlier uh, presentation. Uh, Scratch is great. Uh, Scratch has you know, a bunch of, of pre-built things. Scratch is one of the things that I like about Scratch is that you can draw on and a canvas and then reuse those canvas objects. So the kids were drawing faces and that was like they were happy as a, just having this as a drawing program to begin with. Um, again, one of the things that we found difficult is, is kind of the event-based nature of this and the control structures. Paul just doesn't get it yet. Uh, but pair programming, it's, it's working with them. You can get something useful and they see what the changes are made and then at some point they can just take over. Uh, so that's been kind of good. Um, Code Academy is another resource which is available. Uh, I think uh, this is probably something that I'm going to point uh, Thomas at very soon. Uh, but I, it's it's for a, it's I would say it's for a little bit older. It's for kind of secondary school uh, age kids is my personal opinion. But the Khan Academy computer science stuff. Now this is this is amazing. You have kind of massive libraries of drawings and and and. Uh, and, and stuff that you can do with them. It's got the gamification of you go up in levels. Um, you're kind of constantly seeing instant feedback to the stuff you're doing. And, um, and you've got pre-built code that you can just change numbers and see what happens. So Thomas actually loves this. It's, uh, it's been a great success for me. OK, so the key part of all of this is that I'm trying to teach the kids that they have control. Uh, over their environment, that they do have power, that they have uh, authority over what's happening in their computer environment and in their physical environment. And um, I think that's, a, that's, an important, uh, that's, that's an important thing for, for, for me to pass on to them. So I have a few minutes. I'm happy to take uh, questions. I know this is a big room, so it's going to be a little bit tricky. Or we can finish up 10 minutes early. Anybody have any suggestions for, for coding resources, right? Because I know I, I, I was a, at the end, you're probably all expecting a heavy electronics lecture here. And you know, when you're working with eight-year-old kids, that's not going to happen. So, What age did I get started? With what?
So the, the toys, they, from year and a half, two years old, the, the big chunky bricks, that was, that was like very early. Um, the, the Meccano, maybe five years old, six years old, it, was, it started off with me helping them. And then, you know, I mean, I think the important thing is doing it with, with them. It's, it's kind of an educational process as well for me. Uh, it's also a way to play with my kids. You know. <laughs> uh, the electronics is uh, maybe a year ago. I got, my, I got that electronics kit actually last year at, at, uh, at OSCON. Uh, I was very eager to try it out with the kids. Um, Paul was a bit small last year. He's getting into it now. Yeah? Cool. Uh, so the, the, the first uh, hack that uh, you, you, she taught her, shot, taught her kids was how to change the, the batteries with a screwdriver. On her, on her toys, which is you know hugely empowering. It's broken. Oh, I can fix it. Yeah. Yes. Kids are in traditional normal schools. Um, they're traditional normal kids. So it's just, I, I don't know how the indoctrination is going so far. They don't seem to be. They don't seem to be outliers in the, in the school, so it's they're, like I said, they're they're not particularly precocious, so it's uh, no, it's been fine, it's been fine. So I'll take you and then you. <laughs> oh, they, they yeah, they love the Wii. Um, we've resisted getting them. I I mean the whole one of the things that I've I've said is that that the value of of kind of playing with others and sharing. Is important, so we've avoided the, um, you know, the personal, the, the Game Boy Pro and or whatever. Um, but yeah, they love the Wii. So I mean, that's another challenge: is you know, can I play a game on the Wii or you know, uh, not the electronics again, Dad? <laughs> yes. Cell phones. I thought Thomas is 11 years old. He's in like he's a well. It's as a parent, you know, I have a certain amount of control over what I buy my kids, <laughs> and and we have a f very sort of clear philosophy on that. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it's not a problem. Yes. Okay. Well, one of the things that we've been a little bit reluctant about is is um, internet connectivity, just because there's so much. I mean, you don't even see it as an adult, but you know, when you're when you're sitting there with your kids and you've got like escort ads coming up, and it's it's just it's uh, and, and click here to to install the new game, and it installs like a bunch of crap with it. Okay. But they've, what we found is they've, they've been happy with uh, on the, on the, the netbook that they have, which has a Fedora on it. Um, they've been happy using the games that are that are available. And I've installed a bunch of games, and there's uh, Tux Paint is on there. They love Tux Paint. Um, uh, Tux Math is on there, and they do a little bit of that. But uh, Edge Ubuntu, uh, not Edge Ubuntu, uh, um, uh, Je Compris, uh, which they liked earlier, and now they've kind of grown out of it, which is weird because I thought it was going to evolve with them, but they. Je Compris is like boring the hell out of them now. Um, I hope there are no Je Compris developers in here. But um, I can't see the hands further back than about the tenth row. So if you do have your hand up, um, I see a hand over here. I have an artist in the family. Yes. He keeps. He tr he wants to keep everything. So Tux Paint, that's that's like I mean he's a big Tux Paint guy, and Tux Paint that's not a problem. He just you know it saves versions and that's fine. Um, we haven't had any like storage issues or anything. No no need to burst out to S3 yet. <laughs> Oh, 
Ah. Not something I've encountered so much. Yeah? Um, so, so for example, the, the Father's Day gifts and things like that, the, the, well, we have a big box that we keep all of the, the Father's Day gifts in, but, the, but some of the arts and crafts projects end up you know, falling apart through neglect after about a couple of years. But we, we hoard quite a bit, more, quite a bit more than I'm comfortable with, to be quite, <laughs> and to be quite honest. <laughs> so I think we'll, we'll call it a day. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a...